afternoon, everybody. I have uh, an esteemed uh, panelist here who is going to talk uh, everything about uh, the future of the consortium model. Uh, so we're going to start off with um, a little of the past or a little of uh, setting the scene, as it were, in terms of what a traditional subsea cable consortium is comprised of and a little bit how it works. Now, uh, Hathim, I think you were going to uh, kick us off in terms of what, what, what the traditional model looks like. Thank you. Uh, yes, um, the legacy consortium model, first, before we, we highlight this, we need to highlight the different technology happens, and uh, because this is very important in defining the agreement of the consortium itself, the construction and maintenance agreement. Um, let's say uh, the, the new model of SDM and the high fiber count come in the last three to four years. Before that, most of the system was uh, two to three fiber pairs. and um, Accordingly, um, the, um, the construction and maintenance agreement, the consortium itself, the model itself, um, the, the, we have the agreement and such agreement is defining the ownership and the entitlement for each party. It's uh, defining the governance of the agreement, the, um, um, the, uh, the governance of the o &M payment, the operation and maintenance, and usually we have a centralized NOC operation, uh, op operation center. Uh, we have uh, more centralized operations than uh, dependent or independent uh, uh, operation. Um, um, such agreement also puts a certain limitation on the assignments, uh, title transfers. So um, this is the legacy uh, model we have or consortium model we have. But at the same time, such model was very helpful to build ultra long haul systems uh, with, let's say, multiple landings where you, um, you can have, let's say, a cleared uh, definition for the permitting process or the um, access of the cable stations. Uh, it's not that open cable access, but at the end of the day, you understand exactly how you can access the cable stations, who are the backhaul provider that can access, what are the cross-connection fees that you should pay. So um, this is a legacy, let's say, uh, model we, uh, we, we had in, uh, in, in the past. Definitely in the last four years we have uh, a new, let's say, or uh, improved, let's say, uh, consor model for the consortium, improved agreement, and I think this is what we will discuss now in the... Uh, Absolutely, yeah, yeah. I mean, build, building on that legacy, um, we now have a, a lot of uh, private uh, cable models. Uh, Tanzi, I was going to defer to you as the uh, kind of resident hyperscaler representative on this panel in terms of... Um, you know, uh, what those solo builds look like for, for Meta? Um, yeah, so we at Meta have been involved in quite a lot of um, consortiums over the last few years. And then more recently, on some very specific routes um, and with very specific kind of uh, use cases, we have started to look at some solo builds. So um, where we... One of the benefits that we've found for solo builds, there aren't, there aren't a huge amount, but one of the main benefits is just the agility. So with a consortium, obviously, you need a lot of people to agree to the same thing. There's a lot of different changes with speed of decision making. So where we unfortunately don't have flexibility and don't have any... Um, don't have the ability to delay or move out for other parties we've started to look at solo builds which is kind of a private cable system we would fund it all of us all ourselves um but it does it does open up a lot more challenges with things like landings licenses um and even addition you know spare capacity what 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 could potentially happen with that as well so um that's what we found with solo builds yeah Absolutely. Um, and there was, you know, in, in preparation for this call, there was mention of uh, a hybrid subsea cable model. And I believe, Owen, uh, you mentioned it in our call in terms of uh, this um, model whereby it kind of looks like a consortium cable, um, but it's set up where someone is kind of leading it or driving it. And I was wondering if you could touch on that a little bit for, for those kind of uh, models that sit somewhere between the two. Yeah, sure. Um it's probably worthwhile just touching on some of the disadvantages of the consortium model from four or five years ago. So, so 
uh, and a lot of this relates to kind of open access or the technology. So people would often buy into a system and then they would attempt to kind of do an upgrade and they would find a particular segment of the route was constrained and they were perhaps too late to do an upgrade or, or thing and therefore people were made a significant investment in the system and they would get frustrated that they could not use it uh, to its full potential. Secondly, they, they would be on a system that would have many landings, but often they could not get any benefit from all of those landings. So the, the whole issue of open access and cross connect actually did stifle the original consortium model. Um, However, how, you, you, the consortium model is really good for cooperation. So if you are going to many landings, if you are going to uh, different regulatory models, not everywhere is as open as Europe or US, uh, and where you, you are going to have to have local partners and you're going to have to comply with potentially some really complex regulations. You then settle on that, that maybe where the, the, the consortium model is heading, where you very definitely go for a open cable station model, you very definitely go for dedicated spectrum or fibers to individual owners, so you remove any of the issues with about you know, what have you bought into and being able to get access to it at all times. But you, are, but you make use out of the cooperation element to kind of build the cable stations, operate the cable stations, and uh, allow the system to go through. Uh, certainly some of the things that we've, we've been involved on, on one of the private systems and on the Atlantic and on to Africa in, in, in thing. And you certainly find, certainly find quite a few of the disadvantages of kind of like doing it yourself. So, when you go to a cable station on a, on a hybrid system, you may end up with five, six, seven different DCN networks. Just the complexity of ordering your DCN sounds really simple, but it's not. And that, that really starts to come out. So this is where you think the hybrid model is where we'll probably be heading towards as part of uh, the, the future. Absolutely. Um, so before we kind of uh, move on to the slightly more regional uh, kind of picture, because uh, I think that does play an important part here. Uh, Hatham, I did want to come back to you because um, you did uh, mention to me earlier this, this idea of, is there a certain prerequisite um, for a subsea cable um, model to be considered a consortium? For example, is there a set number of participants? Uh, for, for the consortium model as a concept, definitely it's like a cooperation between more than one party. Okay. Mm -hmm. However, uh, what we have seen in in, um, in the last, let's say, five years, um, a sort of it's it's more like a joint build approach, more than a consortium model. Okay, so it's like maybe uh, one or two, maximum three parties, would like to build the system. Okay, and this is definitely with the new generation of the uh, agreements, this is much much easier than than before, and definitely the time to market, the uh, the time uh, needed to. Uh, finalize and sign the agreement, the funding itself is much, much faster than the legacy consortium. So basically, I'm, personally, I'm not considering a sort of uh, a joint belt with two parties, maximum three parties as, as a consortium. It's still under the private cable, okay? But it's like a joint belt, okay? Uh, we cannot apply the consortium idea here because simply in the consortium idea, uh, definitely uh, you need to, uh, let's say, um, define um, a, a lot of things like, like ownership, like assignment of rights, like uh, a title transfer, uh, upgrade rights, all of such technology upgrades. So this is more complicated than the private. So for me, I'm considering the systems with the two owners uh, or maximum three owners is more private than a consortium. Absolutely, I think that's a great point to, uh, to bear in mind. So if we switch gears then um, to the current, the current regional picture of uh, consortium versus private versus hybrid, if we want to include that as well, because um, I think that's an important part because the picture isn't the same um, everywhere. So if we start um, with kind of North America and Monica, if I could go to you in terms of what that breakdown looks like uh, in, in certain regions. Mm -hmm. Okay, I will speak about the experience that we have with Telsius in the main regions that we operate, which is the Americas and Europe. Yep. And basically, uh, here we have a quite variety of, of uh, mixture of uh, the type of 
of uh, cable systems that are supplied. So in the Americas, uh, we can provide an example of Brusa, which is a private system that was deployed by Telsius back and put into service in 2018 with 11,000 kilometers of subsea cable, uh, next generation ships and connecting Brazil up all the way to Virginia Beach. It was a pharaonic uh, investment uh, at the time and uh, also providing uh, with the lowest latency route between North America and uh, Latin America through um, Brazil. Then we can also provide a, a private system, which is our Ionic SAM-1, which is a 25,000 kilometer cable system surrounding all Latin America region. And uh, it is the fifth longest uh, submarine cable in the world. It was uh, deployed back in, in the year 2000. And uh, it, that was a huge pharaonic investment as well. Uh, so, in terms of it provides the, the connectivity to the main region that we are providing service into, which is uh, Latin America. Uh, besides these private systems, we also have examples of uh, in the region collaborating with a carrier uh, such as America Mobile uh, with the deployment of Mistral, which is a, a cable system that connects uh, all the Pacific coast of Latin America. It was deployed back in uh, 2021 to put into service and it connects all the way um, from uh, Puerto San Jose in Guatemala all the way down to uh, Valparaiso in Chile with landing as well in uh, Ecuador and uh, Lurin and uh, other places in, in Chile as well. Uh, apart from Mistral, which is a next generation system as well, we also have in conjunction uh, some capacity in Google's Tanat and Junior in the region. And uh, with Mistral, with Tanat and with Junior, and also with the connectivity of Brusa from Brazil to uh, all the way to the U United States, what we are able is to provide a diverse path of connectivity with next generation systems to all the needs of uh, the connectivity to Latin America from anywhere else. Uh, and apart from this, we're also providing a, a new generation system uh, that uh, we recently announced in, uh, in 2023 to be ready in service in 2026, which is Tikal will be part in the Caribbean to connect uh, Puerto Barrios uh, in Guatemala to Miami in Boca Raton, which will be the fastest and uh, highest reliable uh, route in the region also with landing point in Cancun and potentially as well analyzing how to land in Barranquilla as well. Besides all this private and, and uh, this uh, TICAL system also is done in collaboration as well with uh, America Mobile, uh, it's an important carrier in the region. We can also provide examples of consortium cables where we participate, such as PCCS, the Pacific Caribbean Cable System, which we are part of the consortium with other four players to provide connectivity as well in the Caribbean. This uh, cable was put into service back into um, 2015, and it's a 6,000 kilometer cable. So this provides a, a big uh, ex examples on how the North America and the Latin America region are connected through different sorts of cables, such as private own, own as well as uh, collaboration agreements with other players, as well as consortium. Apart from that, we can also provide examples in the transatlantic uh, to provide the, the, the connectivity of this whole region into Europe, where we um, can have uh, the example of Marea, that was a, a project done in collaboration between Telsius, Meta, and Microsoft. It's a next generation cable system which was deployed and put into service back in 2018, which more than 6,600 uh, kilometers of cable, 100 and uh, uh, almost 200 terabits per second um, uh, of capacity, and connecting Virginia Beach with uh, lower southern route uh, that uh, from the traditional ones in the transatlantic uh, which is uh, the, the the southern route connecting into the northern part of Spain um, typically 
and also we are part of um, have some capacity as well in Dunans in Google's Dunans uh, cable system with multi terabit uh, capacity. So in the region of the Transatlantic, we see uh, privately owned mainly cables with some formerly uh, more uh, players in in the in the in the play, but also this privately owned cables with less less players also in the arena. Thank you, Monica. I think that's uh, given us a really uh, clear picture of a very mixed kind of bag in terms of uh, the model uh, that's being used there. Um, Carol, can we go to you in terms of what you're seeing in Europe in terms of the, uh, the mix of the uh, uh, consortium models versus hybrid, etc., or private? Yeah, um, I'm embarrassed to follow Monica <laughs> with such an impressive catalogue. So, Tabnet has assets in the Americas, but predominantly what we talk about here is European and specifically Nordics. And categorically, Tabnet would never be able to enter a consortium model because of a specific subset of customers that we have, who are oil and gas customers that simply would not allow a consortium model when we have to access some of their facilities in the North Sea. So that's specifically Tampnet. However, if you look at this from a, a European telecoms subsea market perspective, I think that because of the maturity of the market and the fact that there are no social driven or relatively few social driven connectivity challenges still to address, we're looking at um, projects that are customer driven. And the speed and agility that, that Tanzi spoke about is relevant to, to all of us. And in order to deliver what our customers are demanding from us in the time frame that they're talking about to match up with data center deployments, we simply don't have the, the, the facility to take into account somebody else's objectives. So for us to find a path to our customer objectives and indeed our investors' objectives, we have to go alone. We can find a path if we are the people responsible for the planning, for the vendor selection, for everything else, and meet our customer demands and our shareholder demands. But if you're looking at a scenario that you have multiple parties with uh, an opinion, it's, it's very challenging to, to consider that sort of a mogul field of, of, of obstacles to address. So from a European point of view, I recognize that I'm sitting here in a pretty um, fortunate position to say we can, because of the, the, the way that the market has developed, move very quickly on our own and satisfy what is a really dynamic market at the moment. I sat here 12 months ago and heard about projects that have the lights switched on now. And indeed, we've done a subsea cable project that we went contract in force on the 6th of January, and it will be operational, fingers crossed, but we're past, I think, the truly risky point uh, by Christmas of this year. And that's just something that we could not envisage if we had had any other partner and, and that's something that I look at as well within, within this conversation. What's a consortium model and what's a partnership? Because ultimately you want to get the deal done. And whatever the contract title may be, ultimately we, we, we have partners in this. But for us to, to move at the speed that we have needed to move, we had to do it alone. And I think that from a European perspective, that's going to become more and more common. The big trans-oceanic connectivity projects will always have um, a benefit to having multiple players, multiple parties. But if you're talking regional systems, I, I do believe that Europe's at a point where you will get a better return for your owners and a better experience for your customers if you have the ability to just get on and do it yourself. So. I'm the, I think, the, the slightly negative one, but I'm in a fortunate position when we're thinking about what the future of the consortium model is for, for Europe. I think we may have gone past that to, to some degree. Yeah, no, I think that's a very re a realistic approach, and I, I like your point on the kind of customer-driven customer uh, kind of viewpoint on that. Um, so then, if we can move then to the Middle East, Abdullah, uh, can you give us a, a picture of, of what it looks like in kind of the Middle East in terms of the private versus the uh, consortium-based model? 
Uh, I believe in the uh, Middle East region, I think we have all these uh, models in place. Uh, and I can put it in three stages historically. At the beginning, at the first stage, it was the traditional consortium base. That base just to cater the demand for the basic services of the telecom for the uh, Middle East countries. And we can have at that time, for example, the CMW3 that are first in 2003 which is consortium from the operator from the Middle East and from the other regions. And the same stage, there is also the short cable that linking the countries together with the initiative of the operators of these countries. I can remember the um, FOG, which is the cable that linking the GCC country which, with, with each other. And also the S1 that linking Saudi with Sudan. Uh, this uh, consider private since it's only one operator and the same time it is just to cater the basic at that time um, uh, telecommunication uh, services. The second stage while we have the broadband evaluation at that time and there is increased demand in the data the operators in the region they are engaged in more consortium based uh, and we can see the series of CMW, uh, um, the CMW4, for example, uh, MENA, EIG, all these consortiums coming at that area just to cater also the increasing demand of the data. Now we are in the third stage, where is there, by the way, even in the second stage, we also witnessed the private cable that coming from east to, uh, to west, and on their span of route, they consider the Middle East to landing their uh, cable just to have the Middle East demand part of their business case and the investment consideration. Um, one example is the Falcon at that time, which is privately built by the uh, cloud exchange, and also TGN, which is also investment by Tata, which is considered the Middle East part of their business case. The third stage, while also more investment uh, from the um, region operators to cater also the increasing demand for the um, um, data and also driven by the latest uh, transformation initiative in the region, um, which is in the place right now, I can mention uh, CMW6, sorry, uh, E1 and CMW5, which is part of that um, stage. Lately, we witness more private let us say cable, as we are Haytham definition, once it consists of the three, uh, let us say, uh, member, it's still private. I can mention the blue and Roman, which is also cater the hyperscaler demand in the region. Uh, this is also planned to be landed in, 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 in the region very soon. In addition to that pipeline, uh, si um, um, like CMW6 and Africa One, also that consider based on the consortium base. Uh, so, in, in, at the end of the day, I can see all of the model is there in the Middle East, and we expect more to become with the various, either private or maybe um, hybrid or even consortium. Absolutely. Um, so, I think we've kind of given the, the regional uh, kind of perspective uh, enough of a go. I, I was curious to, to uh, speak to the evolution of open cables and how that kind of feeds into the consortium cable model. And Colin, I'd like to come to you on that one. Um, what, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, sure. I mean, Owen's already touched on the, the, the new model of consortia. Um, I, I think that's going to be the go-forward model for consortias um, from here on now. We won't see the old, older traditional consortias anymore. Um, the new, um, I, I call it a modern consortia, is really where the carriers get together to um, procure the submarine cable. And then instead of, in the old way, it was sliced up by capacity, and you'd put in some capacity and slice it out that way. The owners will slice it up by fiber pairs or... or or half a fiber pair, or a quarter of a fiber pair, or a third. And, um, and the, the models really require, because a lot of these countries where these submarine cables go to, you need to have that local presence and knowledge for, to work with the regulator, to work with the landing stations, to land the cable, to, to, to do all that working together. Um, and then, but the flexibility it gives is that once the cable is built, the fiber pairs are owned by the operators, and then they have the speed upgrade and deploy their equipment and 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 um, get, you know the latest generation of um, 
SLTE transponder equipment in place and, and go at the pace that each individual owner needs to go at for their business case. And it gives us a kind of a good model because it's a, um, it gets over the hurdles of all the complicated areas where you're building the submarine cables, you work together, but then you have the flexibility of your own fibre pairs and building your network out as you need when you need it. Absolutely. Any other thoughts on the uh, relevance of the uh, open cable model to the consortium model? Abdullah, I think you had some thoughts on that. I create a good question. And yeah, I'm, I'm, it's definitely the open access or open cable system has impact on the consortium either commercially or operationally. But uh, what, what do we mean by, by open uh, cable system? And the, the typical cable system is, consists of two parts, the width segment and the dry segment. The width segment has the, all the marine uh, equipment, the fiber ca uh, cable itself, the um, repeater, uh, and also the uh, branching unit, while the dry uh, segment has the transmission uh, equipment. Actually, the, the open system, I can, very simple, very high level definition, which is the decoupling between these two parts. Uh, so any, the owner of the cable system, they can design, um, 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 procure, implement commissioning the width segment separately from the um, uh, dry segment and from the transmission equipment. That, that will give multiple values. How it's practically affecting and impacting the consortium, by this approach, there will be, um, let us say, very clear investment unit, which is the dark fiber. Every fiber will be treated separately from the other fiber system, so that that will give the owner the flexibility to light up the fiber by its own preferred vendor, and even whenever he needs, so that he has the control when and how to light the um, fiber. Uh, also, that will give um, the efficient and, and, and um, let us say, that the urgency and the demand for the demand. For example, if there is any urgent demand, he can move alone without the consortium. He can even adapt the new, new technology by adapting the new technology by himself directly with his prepared uh, technology partner without moving with the consortium. That will provide the agility that is required by the hyperscalers and the big operators. Uh, so, again, how it's impacting the consortium that will um, have, let us say, the, the appetite for the operators, for the hyperscalers, even for the, let us say, the private investment group to invest in this consortium as long as they will have their own asset, their own, uh, let us say, separate independent asset they can manage it operationally and commercially alone and also give them the freedom whenever need to provision, a, um, let us say, the, the capacity or, or the upgrade. Uh, I think this will create the floor for the, um, all the stakeholders to join again and again in, in a consortium either with a small consortium consisting with, with three and, and um, four, for example, players or more as a normal consortium. Absolutely. Um, so. What about the, the kind of the business case and the, the kind of the funding options or even the investment appetite? How does that then affect the subsea cable um, ownership model? And Carol, I, I distinctly remember you having quite a strong opinion on this, so I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit here. But it, it, does that play a part? I have opinions on everything. Um, it does, and it does specifically with the amount of private equity, I think, that, that's involved. And again, I speak mostly from a European perspective in the telecoms market and the, the demands that they have on um, ownership, long-term ownership, the return on investment, and how that is made far more complicated and far less attractive if you are navigating other, other parties. And I think specifically if you talk about other parties that are likely to change over the lifetime of an asset like a subsea cable, because if you're going to assume that that's there for 20 years plus, the current model seems to be that the private equity investments will change hands every five to seven years, let's say. So you have a scenario at the start when you were entering into a subsea cable project where there could be three flips of ownership. 
and, and, and I think that's a challenge for everybody involved. If you've got multiple parties with similar ownership arrangements, then that becomes very challenging over a long period of time. And then on top of that is the point that I, I, I mentioned earlier on. Our investors want to get the maximal return that they can out of a significant multi-million, multi-multi-million dollar investment. And, and sharing that pot doesn't sit with the private equity model. And I think when I think back on some of the earlier versions of consortia cables that I've, I've, I've sort of seen throughout my career, there were similar type companies with similar ownership structures, similar pedigrees from the point of view of how long they had been in existence and how long they expected to be in existence. So you did have a sort of alliance of like-minded or similar structured entities. And that's very different now. We see lots of M&A within a European perspective. And that becomes a real challenge from a from a contract, from a legal point of view, just to keep on top of that over a long period of time. Um, and then similarly for change of control scenarios that will happen over the course of that as well. I think it's another area where I just find it really difficult to see how this plays out over an extended period of time with so much change. Um, but predominantly, I think, from, from my own direct experience, you have shareholders, you have investors, you have owners that really want to maximize the investment. There's no shortage of capital available, uh, but there are massive demands on what that return is going to, to look like. And I think that when you had uh, you know, state-backed or you know, second state telcos, that was a lot easier to manage within your own organization. But now I, I just see that getting more and more complicated. And um, the, the, the ownership is going to be a limiting factor for any private equity firm, as I see it, to invest in a consortium cable. Because who, how do you know who your other partners are going to be in 5, 10, 15 years' time while you're still tied into this? So, that, that, that's my take on it, and I think that may also be quite a European view, but it's another obstacle that I see. Absolutely. I'm seeing plenty of people nodding their heads, so I think that was the, uh, it struck the right tone on that one. Um, okay, perfect. Um, Tanzi, I wanted to come back to you, if I may. Um, talk to me about um, the uh, traffic pattern and the influence that that will have on certain subsea cable models. So, for example, at Meta, you know, um, transatlantic route versus like a regional route why what those different requirements are and why and um, yeah absolutely so at meta one of like my job i have two main customers one is our data center team and the traffic that then flows between the data centers and the other one is our edge team and that's um, connecting to our end users and the traffic flow across those two is very different and that that does affect it affects multiple things. Um, timing is the biggest one. Um, and, the, and then secondly, it's also the traffic flow and the capacity that's needed. So for example, on TA, it's a huge route for us and we connect up the two regions we have for data centers, Europe and the US. So um, usually the traffic flow is very high and we don't necessarily need to have uh, any partners to fill up a cable. I mean, cables are getting a lot, a lot bigger now. We're getting, seeing a huge um, change in the capacity roadmaps for those. But generally, we don't need to fill the, the cable in the same way. We'd prefer to have the agility and the speed in order to just build it ourselves. Um, the challenge, though, which always comes up is then how you, how you land them. And so where we're using, where we're connecting up to countries where we ourselves have an entity then that is a lot simpler you can be your own landing party but one of the major benefits of consortiums that we see globally is the the different services and 
you know, skills and attributes that the different businesses within the consortium bring to the party. So although you might have agility and speed, if you're building it on your own for transatlantic, you're then completely responsible and accountable for how it's landed, how you collect the permits, and whether or not those entities are even set up in the, in the right way to suit, for example, some permits, you need to have an entity in the country itself but that entity has to have a director who is who is local who lives there and uh, um, meta is a you know is a large organization and we may not be set up to be able to be you know to create those compliant entities as quickly whereas in a consortium it may be that the partner we're working with already has that and they're ready to go so in that sense you become more agile working with a consortium uh, with with the right partner and then, um, so that's the kind of production side of things. So our data center to data center connectivity. But then on the edge side, where we're connecting up much closer to the end users, that's where we're much more likely to um, firstly have partners who want to build to the same places at the same speed because these, you know, it's growing populations or different, um, the changing landscape then that everyone's trying to get to these same places to serve these end users. Um, so then we're much more likely to have the, the partners that we'd, we'd like to work with, but also our traffic footprint would be a lot lower. So um, we could have uh, one or two pairs on a system rather than needing to have a lot of flexibility and have a lot of pairs just for ourselves. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Um, Monica, if I could come back to you again. Um, talk to me about the relationship between the da data centers and subsea cables as we know very heavily linked, um, but as an integrated ecosystem, what that influence has on the uh, operating models used. I assume, you know, a cable landing station versus a data center may have a slightly different influence. Mm -hmm. okay, thank you for the question. Well, what we see is that in a hyper-connected world where content, cloud regions, as well as applications need to be as close as possible to the end users. What we are seeing is that it's not only important to provide the summary connectivity to provide and transport the content, but as well to be as close to the content as possible, providing the connectivity with terrestrial black holes uh, and uh, to be as close to the data centers as possible. And as well, to, uh, the, the carriers are having an important role in that sense, or not only providing the summary connectivity and the connectivity through terrestrial black holes, but as well to providing co-location services to allocate the, uh, the, the the different data centers, as well as uh, in, including our very important assets such as the landing stations that we have to allocate uh, some of the equipment that uh, it is used for the different uh, edge uh, cloud regions, uh, and as well to provide big space in bigger data centers, uh, such as uh, the ones that we provide as uh, big communication hubs. We have one in Virginia Beach, which is one uh, landing station that we chose in order to uh, maximize and, and to be more efficient of the connectivity that we found that it was missing uh, at the time when we created uh, Marea uh, to be able to be as close as possible to the uh, to where uh, the most region of the data centers in the world are, which is Ashburn and Richmond in uh, Virginia. So we chose uh, Virginia Beach uh, in order to allocate uh, different equipment, not only for submarine uh, connectivity, but as well the allocation of, of, uh, of different uh, hyperscale contents as well. Uh, in addition to that, we also provide a connectivity in our Dario uh, communications hub in the northern part of Spain, which is uh, where uh, Marea lands in uh, Sopelana in the northern part of Spain, but we provide backhaul connectivity into a big region, which is uh, Dario, uh, to provide a big communications hub to provide the connectivity to the rest uh, of the hubs in Europe. And uh, what we are seeing is that as well, the, the landing stations uh, of the different submarine cable systems are becoming very valuable assets to uh, evolve into small data centers or bigger data centers, depending on the space uh, and uh, energy 
uh, being allocated in the in the landing station as well. For example, we are evaluating very closely the evolution of of certain uh, cloud regions uh, and certain areas in um, in the places uh, in the Americas where we operate. For example. Um, Barranquilla is a good example where our uh, future um, we're looking into Tikal cable system potentially landing there uh, as we are seeing a lot of uh, cloud regions evolving into and going into Latin America and Colombia has a very unique position that provides connectivity to both uh, the the Atlantic and the Pacific coast so it's uh, it, it what we see is that in a combination of not only connectivity, but as well as uh, collocation space and energy, as well as value-added services such as uh, IP transit and security, is uh, what we need to, to provide a whole mixture uh, in the internet ecosystem that we are nowadays. Oh, absolutely. Um, Owen, I was going to come to you for my next question, which was a little bit forward thinking here, and I'm pretty sure everybody on this panel has an opinion, but I'm going to start with you and then We'll kind of open it up to everybody else. But um, the role of the carrier, I think through our conversation, we've established that the role is changing, right, in terms of the, the carrier in the consortium uh, model. Um, are they, there's a question here, uh, whether or not carriers are kind of better suited to kind of support more so on the compliance side and the logistics side, and of course, as the landing um, partners, et cetera, or even cable maintenance. Are we seeing more of a role for carriers in that space as opposed to the kind of owner operator side of it, the traditional side? Uh, absolutely. I, th I think as the new systems roll out and they come from both the private and the consortium worlds, you, you kind of find yourself in a slightly different position. So in a normal consortium model, there is a common good. Everybody is striving to achieve a common aim, and therefore everybody would likely to do is, is put assets into the consortium to carry out this work for the, for the common good. So it tends to be a, co a cooperative model. On a private system, you are, you, you, you've got someone leading it. Somewhere, you know, in many cases, it could be OTT, it could be a private equity investor, and therefore, the carrier is kind of like providing a service. They are providing a kind of like a, a you know, an end-to-end -end service for landing the cable, providing the regulatory model, maybe providing backhaul, uh, by building new fiber. So, so in, the, in the UK, for Amity and to Africa, we have built new fiber with ultra-low-loss fiber from Bude all the way through to Slough in, uh, in the many data centers you can find in, in, uh, in Slough. So those two models, and, and, and certainly something we found in working in two, in two different consortia, one is a private and one is a consortium, is sometimes my teams get confused as to the role they're playing. And so when you go in, I think it's really you, you have to be really clear what role you are playing. Equally, where we look forward, normally you would invest in the cables that you provide services into. That is the normal model. But increasingly, we will find that there are many cables that you do not need to invest in. You do not need that capability, but you will still provide a professional service to land the system. And therefore, much more of a service-based rather than investment kind of view on, on that particular route. Any other thoughts from our panelists? Colin, any thoughts on the changing role of the carrier? <laughs> from your perspective, of course. <laughs> yeah, no, no, ab absolutely. I, I completely agree with uh, Owen here. The, the, the carrier is absolutely instrumental to um, provide the services um, in countries where you need to get submarine cables, right? And they, um, they can participate as an owner and become part of a consortia, or they could just provide that service as the importer of records, provide the, the you know the local knowledge, the, the the regulatory oversight to make sure everything goes smoothly, to get the permits, um, and um, I, I, it really depends. I think it depends on the the country and the location and the carrier as to whether they just want to provide that service or whether. And, and maybe procure some capacity on that cable, or whether they want to be an investor and become part of the consortia model. And you, you might find situations where there's a new submarine cable hitting multiple cable landing stations, and you have a mix. And you have you know various carriers participating in various carriers, just providing the services to help get the, the cable landing where it needs to be landed. You know, the hyperscalers will have their requirements, 
and they will be very different from the you know the the, the carriers and um, they will engage carriers to either participate or, or provide a service as as needed any other thoughts um, I was just going to add that as well that one thing that we found with consortiums is if a carrier is a part as an owner as well it can really be beneficial for um, decision making you know if you've got we we often use the phrase skin in the game because if you're really pushing to have a specific deadline or a specific you know survey marine install etc having your partners also needing that capacity very quickly really helps you what you otherwise if you're purely looking at carriers as a service provider then it then there's just a completely different um, time frame and it'll depend on what their internal you know decision making is whereas if you're all on that cable system together and you know one party's providing you know more funding because they're a, a, a larger owner but another party's providing a huge amount of services that can really make the make the decision making balanced and kind of to your point it makes it a lot more collaborative if you haven't got one big party and telling people what to do you've just got everybody really working together to get that system built and then operated and maintained for 20 years 25 years however long we can get them to to stay in system for absolutely well before i go move on to my final question i think i can see what appears to be a question on slido are there any specific challenges to a consortium cable terminating in a data center instead of a cable landing station does anybody want to take that question? I, I can take that. Okay, Colin, go yeah, for it. N no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, seriously, uh, I mean, it really depends on how far away the data center is from the cable landing station. Um, it depends on the quality of the cable between the cable landing station and the data center, whether you need one path because it's never going to break or two paths for protection or in some countries you actually need three paths um, and um, that um, th there's no insurmountable challenge to doing this it makes a lot of sense to actually have the, the terminating equipment in the data center you know 20 terabytes of data terminated in a cable landing station and a beach where nobody lives is not really very useful you know, you need to have it in a data center to connect to the services that you want to connect to. So it does make a lot of sense. There are some trade-offs. If the data center is a long way away, you might compromise the amount of capacity you get in the submarine cable because of the backhaul section. But if it's relatively short, you shouldn't be compromising on that and it absolutely makes sense. Absolutely, perfect. Owen, sorry. Go yeah, just adding to that. Um, so the relationship to the cable station and the data center doesn't have to be the same for the entire period of the uh, of, of the life of the cable, which could be 20 years. So on day one, one of the benefits of open systems is carriers often have a lot more capacity than they actually need. Um, I, I would say the kind of like the growth of capacity has been dominated by the hyperscaler section. The, the you know, on certain key international routes. The carrier demand has, is not growing by anywhere near that, that kind of level. So by ac getting access direct to fiber or spectrum, you may well have a lot of capacity for a long time. So on day one, you could be in inefficient in your, uh, uh, in your use of your spectrum. You could say, I could go a very long way from the cable station to a nearby data center and extend the C-band the whole way. But maybe in five years time, you have then grown your capacity gradually over that period. And then you may decide, well, now I'm going to put uh, terminating equipment in the cable station and have a back all route because then I get the maximum benefit out of my, uh, uh, of my uh, asset, uh, the subsea asset that you own. Absolutely. You going to add to that? Uh, actually, I, I have one point here. It's, it's, if it's a neutral data center, the answer is no. Okay. If it's not neutral data center, it's like the cable station. So it's uh, <laughs> okay because we so we're redundant. You know, it's uh, that you can terminate your cable in the data center, but at the end of the day, we find that the data center is not neutral. It's not like, let's say, open access data center where you can find a lot of IB providers, uh, hyperscalers. So I mean, at the end of the day, it's it's open access all the way, starting from the data center to the other side, including the cable itself. 
Very good point. Very good point. Okay, so I have my last question. And if it's all right, I'm going to put it to the, all of my panelists because I think everybody has an opinion on this, um, which is, what is the future of the subsea cable model? Now, I know that's a loaded question and we've spent the last hour kind of, uh, you know, peeling away the layers as it were. But maybe if you just give me a little soundbite and I'm going to start with you, Owen, and maybe we can work our way down on your thoughts. Sure. Um, we didn't touch on the Africa region, but uh, if you look at what's happening in Africa, you've had a Google-led system that very much was private and then additions added to it. And then you've got to Africa, which is a very, very large consortium system. What's interesting is come where we are now is actually, although the delivery and the build started off differently, where we're ending up is pretty much the same, which is where you have a high number of users of those systems. People sell their capacity. People buy, build onto uh, private systems. Centralina, as an example, is on the Equiano system, completely separate from the express traffic that Google's using. So you will probably, you will naturally end up with high fiber count systems, many, many users of that system that they'll have, a lot of the capacity will be sold on and that you, you'll have a large number of Spectrum users. Um, we often use the words uh, system within systems. So although everybody will be on those cables, they will not have the same landings. They will not have uh, all of the same access or ownership rights. So you will often see the kind of, you will need to go to many different parties to get exactly what you require. But I think you will end up in, in, in a similar location where there will be lots of people able to serve the demands on those routes. In terms of the future of the, of the cable systems versus the, the, the model, um, I think that the, the model will be driven by partnerships with a few players uh, with open um, cable systems in order to make sure you maximize the efficiency in terms of investment in, uh, to make sure that, that uh, the investment is shared between among different parties. That enables as well to create and, uh, and build cables more rapidly because you can be part of different cable systems without having the full um, responsibility of deploying it by yourself. So, uh, and also this type of model as well with open cables is able to provide you in certain independence as well and the different ownership of fiber pairs as well as choosing the technology you want to do the illumination of, of your fiber pairs and as well when you want to upgrade the, the system uh, on your own fiber pairs as well. So I think it will be a mixture of, of uh, having certain agreements among small limited players uh, to be able to maximize the, the efficiency of the investment and to be able to uh, build cable systems more rapidly and to create and diversify your your routes and create a more robust network for yourself. Carol? So I think notwithstanding everything I've said since I sat down on the stage, I think there's a, a really interesting future for consortium agreements with regard to subsea cable systems not from the commercial side. I mean, I, I think that that's clear from, from my perspective, but from the maintenance side, I do think that there is something going forward for uh, cable system owners in a similar geographic region to coordinate and cooperate on maintenance in specific regions that have a different type of a requirement for ships or repairs or, or, or that type of long-term activity than, than, than anything that currently exists. So you have big one-size-fits-all type models. So from a consortium point of view, I think that that's an area that, that I would like to see an awful lot more cooperation in that, that maintenance area. I still struggle a little bit from, from my own um, perspective on the, the commercial side. Okay. Okay, I'll make it very simple. The reason why we need a consortium model because simply we don't have a strong business case to build a private system. And the moment we have a strong business case, a strong demand, definitely the priority will be for the private one. Because a lot of things, you know, uh, and advantages, time to market, uh, uh, let's say, um, uh, fund itself, the, uh, the uh, assignments, rights, all of this stuff. However, for the consortium model, 
what I'm seeing happening that we are seeing a new generations from the agreement. As I mentioned, it's moving towards joint build more than consortium, okay? Because simply now the ownership is uh, um, is fiber bear or a minimum half fiber bear. So typically the it's not like the legacy consortium model. So you are seeing new generations of uh, of consortia happening now with new generation of agreements uh, give more freedom. It's like I agree that we will we are applying system within system model, okay? So this will keep evolving giving more freedom to the shareholders, number of parties or consortium will be less, okay? Uh, a lot of shadow investment will happen. So this is what we are seeing happening today uh, for, and I'm expecting this will evolve more. To, uh, time to market is very critical uh, in, 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 in building systems. So uh, the less parties you have, the faster system you build. Agility definitely sounds important. Abdullah? Uh, I believe um, the future of the submarine uh, um, uh, business models will be shaped with very, uh, very important factors, such as the, um, definitely the increasing demand for the global connectivity and also for the diversification for the routes and the new uh, diversity and for the resiliency uh, purposes. And also, I think it's very important uh, factor, which is I think, as Mahitha mentioned, the fast, the demand, the critical demand that we're facing right now. Um, and, and accordingly, I think, based on this um, 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 factors, I think there will be points and shared mutual benefit between the stakeholders, I mean, carriers, stake, um, um, cyber scalers, and maybe even the government to engage in mutual and shared projects to develop the cable system. Definitely, it is a main component for the critical infrastructure for the government. So I think there will be more, even a small consortium, or maybe hybrid, to include uh, the new development for the submarine. Um, so I think I look at the the future of consortiums um, also with a lens of what challenges we're facing generally in the industry. So we've got aging vessels, um, very complex maintenance agreements. We've got an incredibly complex permitting process in most parts of the world, which is only getting harder as uh, you know environmental regulations get stricter and stricter. Which you know largely they should. Global warming impacts us all, but. Um, as those challenges get harder to, to solve, I think not only working together within consortiums is, is a great way forward, but even cross consortiums and solving these wider industry issues together, even if it's two private systems being built, working together on those wider issues is definitely um, the way that we're going to solve those challenges. So for me, consortiums will likely always exist for different technical reasons but even cross collaboration across the industry across the you know the carriers and the hyperscalers etc who are all building that collaboration is how we really move move forward yeah i, I mean consortiums are definitely going to play a part going forward for the wet plant um it makes a lot of sense i can see why that would happen i think I, having a slightly different perspective as an equipment vendor doing the upgrade I don't see consortiums anymore. I see individual owners all with their own fiber pairs like a private company now where we will do upgrades for Meta or for Vodafone or for Mobile. They're all got their own system. So while they're part of a consortia for the wet plant, once that's built, um, from my perspective, it's no longer a consortia. Everybody's doing their own thing with their, you know, their own choices, their own technical requirements, their own different routes and landings and backhauls and, and things. So actually, from, from that perspective, Consortia doesn't exist anymore from a vendor perspective doing upgrades. That's an interesting perspective. And don't worry, we won't hold you all to these predictions in a year's time, so you're fine. Um, so we actually have two minutes left, and I did see a question kind of pop up on the screen before we started to wrap up. So I'm gonna quickly throw that to uh, our panelists. And somebody has said, moving on to a different topic, could you speak a little to the business model? What are the current and future revenue streams? Does anybody feel like taking that one on? No? No? Not particularly, but <laughs> I do think that- I mean, the don't model... all raise your hands at the same time. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> 
the models I'm looking at going forward involve an awful lot more dark fiber and spectrum deals. And that's great. That's the way the market is going. But to go back to my challenge with private equity ownership, that's not something that they love. That they would much rather see recurring, steady revenues from um, short-term contracts. So I, I think that we're going to have a challenge as some of our main customers move towards um, fiber or infrastructure type deals because they don't fit into that shareholder model. However, that's the way the market is going, so that's just what it's going to be. And the design of systems now facilitate much higher fiber counts, so it's a possibility when if you look at a model even perhaps 10 years ago, you didn't have that option to sell on entire fiber pairs because it was such a limited asset within a subsea fiber system. So I see it going towards a lot more infrastructures and then maybe it's a different type of a consortium with fractional fiber pairs being sold through, but that's a different one to model compared to what we've all been doing for the last forever. Um, that's my suit. I, I could add to it. So uh, I, I think historically uh, people would invest in a submarine system and they would have their own traffic and then on top of it they would wholesale traffic and then that would get them to a certain investment tier kind of like in depending on how they how big they were in the consortium and everybody would keep compete on the wholesale market but there would always be nuances why everybody would be able to win. Um, I think in the new model just the sheer amount of traffic that we're delivering in these new systems means kind of like there are going to there, there is going to be an oversupply of capacity on certain routes so i actually see potentially the models diversifying where certain carriers will come in only for their own traffic their own internet traffic and they won't invest for the wholesale model because they will end up with an oversupply they won't be able to sell and maybe the other side a professional set of wholesale companies that do a significant amount of wholesale on different routes and maybe we see a bit of a diverging of carriers coming in with a slightly different view brilliant well um that was such an insightful panel thank you so much to to everyone for joining us today uh, please join me in uh, thanking our panelists